Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this special tete-a-tete -tete with Sir Ronald Cohen. I am Neha Gupt, Director of the Impact Future Project and Aspire Circle. Many of you know Aspire already. Aspire Group was founded in 2007 and is the largest impact collaborative in India today with over 400 CXOs engaged from corporations, investors, and nonprofits to help catalyze an impact economy in India. Last year, Aspire launched its Impact Assessments and Ratings Initiative for corporates, funds, nonprofits, and CSR programs. It is my privilege to play a short video introducing India's first homegrown impact rating and certification initiative. Well, impact investing from being a niche invest, uh, investing segment has grown from $25 billion in 2013 to nearly $1 trillion in 2021. Aspire Impact, with its impact assessments, is committed to ensuring impact transparency through standardized impact ratings, which subsume all ESG and sustainability ratings and certifications to support entrepreneurs and investors in their impact journey. Our foundation, Aspire Circle, promotes enlightened social leadership. It builds and scales three impact initiatives, fellowships, scholarships, and internships to catalyze India's leadership capabilities in the social impact sector. Aspire Circle is 200 fellows strong and has awarded 34 scholarships to date. The Impact Future Project, or IFP, was launched in November 2020 and is a unique thought leadership platform which brings together over 200 business, investment, nonprofit, government, and media leaders to generate investment ideas and unlock private capital for public good, enabling India to embrace impact capitalism and impact accounting. In fact, Sir Ronald Cohen spoke at IFP's launch during Sankalp event last year. A special welcome to all our fellows and elders, IFP leaders, coaches, knowledge partners, industry partners, Aspire staff and interns. Last year, we hosted three impact masterclasses with Padma Shri Reema Nanavati, E.D. Seva, Vineet Rai, chairman of Avishkar Group, and Geeta Goyal, country director of Dell Foundation in India. 
This year, we will have three international leaders. Therefore, it's our great fortune we have Sir Ronald Cohen with us today, the Renaissance man for impact. To introduce the conversation and Sir Ronald Cohen, I would like to invite Amit Bhatia. Amit is the founder and CEO of Aspire and formerly inaugural CEO of GSG and the founding CEO of India's Impact Investors Council. Amit, over to you. Thank you, Neha, and welcome, Sir Ronald, and welcome all. And friends, uh, you know, I, I know many of you and can recognize you, although today I don't have a chance to say hello to you individually, but thank you for joining us. I know that uh, you all never hesitate to put your time and energy behind India's impact cause. So welcome again. And you, and you know, it's been my constant endeavor too over the past decade to keep pushing the impact movement forward in India. In both my roles at IIC and GSG, I've always tried hard to unite all the impact actors, all of you here on the screen. And I've also tried equally hard to bring, make sure we bring the best of the world to you as we do today, so we can learn and make lives better for our countrymen and women using the power of impact investment and entrepreneurship. Our latest venture, Aspire Impact, as you just heard, you know, has brought together 200 leaders you know, for a 10-year project to discuss the impact future in a thought leadership forum. Many of our co-chairs are here you know, today. Separately, our impact certification and ratings initiative is the only one in India. It's setting the standard for what comprehensive impact assessment should look like. We rolled out our first two reports last quarter. There are three more coming this quarter, and you will very soon you know, see that we will you know, push in India Inc. to start embracing this whole idea of impact transparency. So it's my special privilege to welcome Sir Ronald Cohen, the original architect of the global impact movement, both to India and to Aspire. He is a true visionary, envisioning new institutions like Bridges Fund Management, Big Society Capital, Social Finance, GSG, new instruments that we all use like social impact bonds, outcome funds, to provide this movement with a real toolkit to conquer inequities, poverty, global warming. I've had the good fortune of working alongside him for three years at GST, and you're about to discover why I felt that if we are going to truly understand this subject, we got to hear from him. But before we launch into our first question, I want to use my privilege and disclose one secret about him. You know, you think it's all serious affair, impact revolution, impact movement, but Ronnie is very fond of telling jokes, especially to diffuse tense situations and discussions. I remember a breakfast meeting with him after a successful event for which we had put in many months and a few things did not go well behind the scenes. So he starts off the breakfast meeting saying, so you've seen it as Churchill did and recalls this joke about Churchill visiting military barracks during World War II to see readiness of his forces. And as Churchill is coming out, a journalist asks him about his assessment of British preparedness. And he says, I hope they scared the enemy as much they scare me. We laughed about behind the scene challenges and moved on. So that's Ronnie. So Ronnie, welcome uh, to Aspire and to India. Pleasure, pleasure, Amit. Wonderful to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person and uh, thank you all for joining us for this exchange of views. So Ronnie, the way we're going to run this uh, 75 more minutes today is we're going to, you know, have lots of questions, both coming from myself and from our guests and audience. And we're going to structure them in several segments, talking about yourself, the state of the movement, impact investing, impact entrepreneurship, impact assessments, engaging corporations, future, and most importantly about your book, Impact Reshaping Capitalism, you know, to drive real change. So let's get started. And I must tell you that even before an impact nation, India is a cricket nation where there's a concept of a second innings during a test match as each side plays twice. Now, your first innings, Ronnie, was all about venture capital and a singular focus on Apex. But in your second innings, you've been a serial social impact entrepreneur setting up all these institutions we spoke about, GSG, Bridges, Big Society Capital, Social Finance, Portland Trust. So can you please help put your two innings in perspective for this audience? Certainly, Amit. Well, I... I left Egypt as a refugee at the age of 11 and was fortunate enough to arrive in Britain where I was welcomed. 
the state paid for my education in a grammar school and then uh, at Oxford. Uh, I got a scholarship to Harvard Business School, the Henry Fellowship. And perhaps for uh, that reason, in part, and because of my family values uh, in equal part, I've always had a desire to help others as I had been helped. And when at the age of 26, as you know, Amit, I decided to go into the nascent field of venture capital, my aim was to do something socially useful in that context of uh, 1972. Uh, that meant creating jobs in Britain, which had millions unemployed, while doing well, because I knew that I would uh, need to be financially independent to help my parents in their old age. But as the years went by and Apex grew and we funded 500 entrepreneurs, I realized that while venture capital was helping people to enrich themselves and the people associated with them, it really wasn't leading to a closing of the gap between rich and poor. And that gap seemed to be widening as venture capital gave uh, entrepreneurs uh, unheard of opportunities to accumulate vast wealth. And so when I received a phone call in 2000 from the UK Treasury asking me to look at poverty and the social issues that stem from it, I immediately agreed and we published a report, we being the Social Investment Task Force at the end of 2000, basically saying it's amazing how ingenious we have been in developing new ways like venture capital of funding people who want to make money. And yet, if we look at the way in which we're tackling issues like poverty, we have been unable to attract investment money to the entrepreneurs who want to improve lives. And that set me on a 10-year path to create uh, the first social impact bond. Now, when the first social impact bond, which was developed by social finance, which started in the basement of my office in Portland Place in 2007, we thought that by designing a new security whose returns depend on achieving a social outcome, in this case, uh, preventing young uh, offenders who had been imprisoned from going back to jail within 18 months, we had fulfilled the, the objective we'd set out in 2000. We'd found a way for those who want to improve lives through charitable organizations or through business to raise money in the same way that a normal business can. And indeed, the, the idea has spread and there are now over 200 impact bombs, including in, in, in India, in 35 countries across the world, tackling 15 different issues. But I realized in 2013 and 14, when I chaired the G8 social impact task force, that actually the social impact bond was signposting us to new economies. The social impact bond for the first time was optimizing risk, return and impact. But if you look more widely as the G8 task force did, you realize, as Amit was eloquently saying, that this process of 
pushing towards optimization of risk return and impact was already underway and was destined to grow very fast. In those days, there were about $10 trillion of environmental, social, and governance investment whose objective is to achieve impact as well as profit. Well, today, the figure is between 40 and 70 trillion. The signatories to the UN, to the UN principles for responsible investment represented assets of 40 trillion. Today, the figure is over 100 trillion. And a chapter of our report, The Invisible Heart of Markets, was entitled the first trillion of impact investment. And as Amit was saying, we achieved that in seven years, which appeared unthinkable then. And so we realized then, and we can see it now in financial markets, that this mega trend to optimize risk, return, and impact had the potential to transform our financial system and our economies. And so we find ourselves, I'll pause here, I mean, we find ourselves today, I think, at a historic junction between two economic paradigms, our traditional risk return one, which served us well for more than 200 years, and the new one, more appropriate for tackling our social and environmental challenges, which is risk return and impact. Now, thank you, Ronnie. And as you know, we move, and you've been the architect of making this world move from risk return to risk return impact, but at the chasm of this change, this transition lies, these words which we hear often that impact investment or impact entrepreneurship is about giving voice to values. And a lot of what we're going to discuss today, and before we launch much deeper, you know, to use Victor Frankl's words, in fact, this is about man's search for meaning, is it not? In a system of capitalism, that has not worked for all, as you just described. So tell us all, you know, that in your lifetime, how have you seen these human values evolve? And, and you've, you know, through your apex journey and now two decades of leading impact, so that we can, you know, kind of tell ourselves that this vision will actually come true. So how have these values evolved? And perhaps even for your own self, what has changed between 1970s when you were, you know, the venture capital czar to now being an impact czar? So I see three major forces changing our world today that have the ability to improve it uh, at scale. The first is the change of values to which you refer, Amit. We see initially young people and now much bigger swathes of our population refuse to purchase the products of companies that are creating harm and refuse to work for these companies. And that's become noticed by investors who realize this had real implications for their investment returns. And the investors, the asset managers in particular, felt the pressure of their clients whose values were also pushing in the direction of ESG and impact. So that's a major force, and we've see it, seen it pick up real momentum in the last uh, decade. The second major force is the force of technology. We're seeing leaps in technology today through artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, the genome and computing coming together that enable us to deliver impact globally 
in ways humanity could never before contemplate. And this has been accelerated by COVID, where we have meetings remotely, but we can also see new models emerge in remote education, remote health, and so on and so forth. And the third major force is the one that Aspire is so in, engaged in pushing forward now, which is that this technology enables us to measure the impacts of companies in a granular way and to analyze their impact performance in a similar way to their profit. And so these three forces coming together today are creating an impact revolution which will build on the tech revolution, as I have mentioned, and which will extend to the disruption of business models in the same way that tech has done. Thank you, Ronnie. And we're going to dive deeper into the impact revolution, but let's pause and we'll pause many times to get a guest question. Neha, any guest questions here? Uh, yes, uh, we have a question here from Shashank Avasthi. Uh, Shashank is the co-founder of Vishesh, a fellow and on the Council of Governors for Aspire Circle. Also the chair of our Accessibility, Disabilities and Inclusion IFP community. Uh, Shashank, over to you. Thank you, uh, Nia. Thanks so much. Hi, Ronnie. Good to see you again. And it's such a pleasure to be able to hear you. It would have been much better to meet you uh, this time. So as the um, opening bowler uh, in the way that Amit said, if it's a cricket pitch, uh, but I have a very easy one. You know, I'm an um, impact entrepreneur. I built a company that works on disability inclusion. I'm also an investor. So I get to see both sides, uh, fortunately, as part of Grey Coast Ventures. Um, you know, given your transition from the private equity space to uh, social impact, what have you found to be most similar or dissimilar between business and impact leadership. You know, people tend to see them in different ways. And um, the other question is, you know, why is it that business leaders haven't really rushed to embrace the movement? We do see momentum building up, right? But a lot of mainstream leaders don't seem to be rushing in uh, to take advantage uh, of this. Is it something that they need to unlearn? What, what's that that, you know, they can learn from your uh, incredible experience as an impact leader. So, Jashank, I am struck by the similarities with the growth of venture capital and the tech revolution. Uh, when I discovered, uh, when I was at business school in my early 20s, that the invention of, of the chip was coming together with young entrepreneurs who had a desire to change uh, whole industries, I felt something was in the air that was going to go very far. We couldn't see in those days that the invention of the chip would lead to the internet, but we could see that it would have a major impact on all businesses. I feel the same way today about impact. There's something in the air which is unstoppable and it's building on this entrepreneurship and innovation in which you are yourself involved. But it is bringing this third dimension of doing good at the same time. And we can begin to see today that risk-return impact delivers better market valuations for companies and will deliver better profits in the future. Because the changes in values make it easier for businesses that incorporate impact into their business models and their operations to attract talent, to attract customers, to attract investors, while at the same time avoiding the risk of regulation and taxation uh, for the harm they create. Now, in creating a new field like uh, venture capital or 
or, or impact um, today, you have to bring a number of stakeholders together. You have to create a sort of global ecosystem. In the case of venture capital, it had to do with the professional venture capital industry. Uh, it had to do with the creation of stock exchanges that were prepared to fund companies which hadn't achieved the profits and often had very low levels of, uh, of sales. It involved changes in government regulation to get pension funds to become involved in investing in, in venture capital. And if they didn't, to explain uh, why they didn't. And we're going through the same thing now with regard to impact. We're beginning to see regulation change. We're beginning to see new business models like Tesla transform 100-year-old plus industries with very well-established leaders and overtake them in terms of company valuation, shifting the whole of the automobile industry away from the combustion engine to electric uh, vehicles. So for me, I have a sense of deja vu. Now, on your second question, a lot of business leaders see this as the future and are adapting to it. They can see impact transparency in the form of impact accounting coming uh, quickly now. We can talk about that. They can see taxation for carbon emissions in the immediate future now. Investors are beginning to have to conform with these objectives because political organizations like the EU are imposing constraints on the ability of investment groups to sell their funds unless they conform to the standards of disclosure that are required. This is why Aspire's efforts are so important in in, in in India. They bring a threshold which compels companies to adhere to the constraints uh, that uh, society and the environment require us to apply to ourselves or otherwise to be singled out uh, for bad treatment. The majority of companies today is extremely hesitant about disclosure. It hasn't yet fully measured its impact. It isn't aware of the influence that this will have on their talent, on their consumers, and on their stock market valuations. And so we are in a period of transition now. Much has happened in the 30s with the introduction of generally accepted accounting principles. You know, in the 30s, or before 1933, every company could pick its own accounting principles, could put a certain amount of its profit into hidden reserves without telling shareholders. And there were no auditors to verify the numbers. And when the idea of gap accounting, generally accepted accounting principles, uh, is what I mean by gap, and the use of auditors were mooted, people screamed, some people screamed in Congress that this would spell the end of American capitalism. But actually, investors had been investing without knowing what profits companies had been making. And this transparency on profit established the foundations for the massive global financial markets we have. The same is happening now with regard to transparency on impact. Trillions are being invested in an attempt to achieve both impact and profit without any transparency on the impacts that companies are creating. 
And so I expect within the next three to five years that some governments will mandate the publication of impact weighted financial accounts that provide transparency on the impacts in monetary terms, in dollars or in euros or in rupees, created by companies through their operations on the environment, through their employment practices on people, and through their products on people and the environment. So the goalposts have moved for businesses. And those who don't adopt early the optimization of risk return and impact will be left behind by new entrants with new business models in the same way that the early leaders of uh, whole sectors like uh, the computer industry and IBM were left behind by Microsoft and Apple. Thank you, Rani. And, you know, I'm going to hold the impact weighted accounts you referred to for a little while later. But as we discussed one group that is hesitant business, I want to get the second hesitant group out of the way, which is governments. And, and especially because the time is opportune, you're, you've just been named once again on this other new G7 task force. And you led the first one, which kind of created this GSG and the movement. And therefore, you've had this you know, unique position from where you have engaged with governments and head of states. But you know, from my own term, I know and I wonder what how, how your thinking has evolved. But governments do have appeared to be a hesitant group. In India at IIC, as we campaigned and advocated with government for even a unique categorization, a classification for impact entrepreneurs, you know, not a B Lab or B Corp like, but a simple separate category, or for impact investors, it's been an uphill task. How do you evaluate government response to these global calls to embrace the movement? I think governments have not yet understood, Amit, how badly they need this movement to be successful. They are coming out of the COVID crisis with massive social challenges and hugely constrained budgets because of the stimulus packages that had to put into effect. They need to bring the private sector, investors, innovation, entrepreneurship to their side in achieving their goals. Thus far, some governments in Europe uh, first, then in the United States, and then in Australia, began to think about this area of impact. But we have not seen the action that we require for this megatrend to really express itself in our mainstream investment and, and, and business markets. And so I am hopeful that this new impact task force created by the UK at the time of its G7 presidency will work closely with the G20 efforts and the working group on uh, sustainable finance with which uh, the GSG and UNDP are heavily uh, involved to put a blueprint for government which leads us to a clear destination where impact transparency and integrity is assured giving impact capital flows, the opportunity to improve lives as they deliver greater profits, but also boosting the development of new securities that achieve profit and impact. For instance, 
when you and I were working together at the BSV on social impact bonds and development impact bonds, we didn't appreciate that just a couple of years later, the bond market would represent one and a half trillion dollars worth of social, sustainable, and green bonds. And that within that one and a half trillion, 10%. $159 billion would be bonds where the rate of interest the corporation pays falls according to the impact it delivers, environmental or social impact. So you see Enel, the Italian utility, issuing $7 billion of pay for success bonds where its interest rate falls if environmental targets are achieved. You see Novartis issuing 1.8 billion euros of bonds where its interest rate falls if its drugs reach more vulnerable populations. So we started out with impact investment in the private asset classes, venture capital and private equity, moving into real estate and infrastructure, it's spreading to the $100 trillion bond market. And now if governments bring us the transparency we need for investors to be able to make intelligent investment decisions and for businesses to have the data to make intelligent investment decisions in their turn, then we can channel the $100 trillion that are invested in public companies to achieve the SDGs and beyond to change our economies so that they deliver solutions rather than create problems as they search for profit. Thank you, Ronnie. And I think as just before we dive deeper into this impact investment and entrepreneurship, perhaps it's time for an audience question. Neha, anyone? Yes, sure, Ronnie. We have a question from Abhishek Agrawal. Abhishek is the Chief Regional Officer of Axion, a leading investor in financial inclusion. He is also an Aspire Circle Fellow and co-chair of our FinTech IFP community. Uh, Abhishek? Thank you very much, Neha. Greetings, Ronnie. It's great to see you. Um, fantastic. It was, it was so heartening to hear you talked about the impact weighted financial accounts back in the days um, 10, 12 years ago, I was working for the municipalities here in India, trying to bring them to the capital market and helping them in terms of creating their outcome-based and fund-based accounting. So hopefully, I think and it has taken them a long time while they have hit the capital market, but we are still a long way to go on the outcome-based accounting. So hopefully we can see sometime soon the, the impact-based, um, weight-based financials. I had questions and it has two sides to it, Ronnie, given that we, and again, as, as Neha mentioned, I come from Axion, the financial services impact investor. So as an impact investor, we hold the keys to the, to the billions and trillions of dollars of investment. But when we talk about the impact matrix on, on these investments, I think given while we are focused in financial services sector, but when I look at across, what can really be done to look at the impact and outcome metrics across, like when we look at banking, insurance, pensions, and, and others, there are, there are multiple ways to look at it. What can really be done to bring them under, under one metrics? The second fold of it is, it, it is and, and uh, if I look at it, I think it has taken us a long time, 70 years plus, to bring our national defense system in India which is Army, and Navy, and Air, under one chief of defense. And it is when this is about security, which is eminent, but not about impact. You know, Impact can, can continue to take its own time. Now, how, what can really we do when we have many regulators on the other side who continue to see these things very differently? So one from the investor side, the other from, from these regulator side, what can we really do to disrupt the, the ways of functionings or allocations um, from, from bringing a larger impact? Very good questions, uh, Abhishek. 
the way to get to a single impact measurement standard is to put a picture on the puzzle. There are 150 or more serious efforts to measure impact. But when you look at them in detail, each of them is crafting a piece of a puzzle. And up until now, when we brought the notion that impact accounting is feasible and valuable, there was no picture on the puzzle. Now we put the picture, and I hope the G7 Impact Task Force will help to do that globally, but now we've put it for the impact measurement community, you can see those providing metrics like tons of carbon, liters of water, measures of biodiversity, employment data, and so all those metrics, beginning to understand how their efforts coalesce to a company's PL on an impact weighted basis. And the efforts that Harvard Business School's IWAI, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, has made to monetize these impacts, shows the way to incorporate these metrics in the PL and in the balance sheet. So I think we have to focus on one message now. Impact accounting is feasible and valuable. Now, there are milestones to it, and Aspire is beginning to prepare the way past each of these different milestones. Companies don't have uh, all of the metrics they need today. The accounting firms that help audit their accounts haven't started to create the pathways to monetization according to set accounting principles that we need. We need the US or the EU or some leading governments now to mandate the publication of impact-weighted accounts three years from now. This will cause companies to begin to measure their impacts, get their impact houses in order, and prepare for a time when their accounts are going to show their impacts very clearly. Now, on the second one, I have a very clear view of the answer to your question. It's inevitable now that regulators will soon have to interfere with existing financial accounting in order to satisfy the needs of markets. Because the data that is emerging at Harvard and elsewhere is that there is a correlation because of the huge weight of ESG money between higher levels of pollution and lower stock market valuations. Now, what does that tell us, Abhishek? That impact data has become price sensitive, stock price sensitive. Now, what is the duty of financial regulators? Their duty is to ensure that any impact sensitive data makes it on a comparable basis in a verified way at the same time to every investor. And so the more the data is used, the more you're going to see the pressure increase on regulators to step in. So let us all, in the way that Aspire is doing, gather all of the available data that exists in the world, and it's increasing exponentially. And nobody thought two years ago uh, that you could look at 3,000 companies' environmental impact in dollar terms, and that in a month you'd be able to look at 3,000 companies' employment impact in, in, you know, in dollar terms, and that just a few weeks after that, you could see how across nine sectors you can measure the product impact on people and planet of, of companies. So things are moving at a very fast pace now. And I think if we can use this data to make investment decisions, to allow businesses to begin to understand 
what they have to do in order to align themselves, this will put unstoppable pressure on regulators to mandate impact weighted accounts. Thank you, Ronnie. And we have many folks here on this call, you know, who are going to, you know, keep asking these questions. And before we invite another guest, I have one more question and on impact entrepreneurship this time. And, you know, in India, as Ronnie, you're aware, the first wave of entrepreneurship was largely in areas like microfinance, which, you know, where we were able to get to scale and some of our best microfinance companies transformed into small finance bank. But the next wave, has been of companies who are, can be best described in ed tech, health tech, clean tech, fintech, agri tech, femtech sectors. And it is becoming hard to distinguish them, whether they are impact enterprises or business enterprises, because they don't self identify themselves. You know, so think of fintechs in India like Paytm, ed techs like Baiju's, and academies, clean techs like Ola Cabs, Ola Electric, health techs like Farm Easy. They think of themselves as regular business ventures to the delight of investors because they later on figure out how to report some impact and look good, but they are not self-identifying themselves as impact. Is this an awareness problem? Is there, you know, risk? These enterprises see that it might close some funding doors. How should we interpret this phenomenon? I think um, companies don't find it advantageous yet to define themselves as impact companies. There is still this uh, lurking suspicion in the world that if you do good and you do well at the same time, you're being philanthropic and giving money away and you make less money. And so investors are suspicious of companies that espouse this new model. The companies are better off doing it and not talking about it. But as the trillions begin to be more discriminating, have reliable data on which to base their decisions and so on, the money will go to those who are delivering impact. I see in uh, my own family office's portfolio today of seed and early stage companies from Israel where impact is, is taking root, as you know, in a serious way. A host of companies that are trying to improve the world as well as make money, but they're not measuring their impacts yet. And if we can get them to measure their impacts today, we will accelerate the trend uh, to invest in, 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 in companies that uh, do so. So, again, the efforts that you're making to distinguish companies from one another according to their impact are very important to driving this forward. The efforts that uh, the B Corp movement has made to do the same thing, make it easier for investors to identify the right companies in which to, to invest. So it's a process. It doesn't happen in a day. It'll probably take three to five years to get to impact weighted accounts. Beyond that, probably several decades to perfect them, which is what happened with our financial accounting system, which has its origin in 1933. And it may be a decade or two before every company has to take into account its impacts. Every management team is focused on it. Same thing happened with technology, right? Some people ignored the arrival of technology and their business models were disrupted and their companies collapsed, uh, you know, while uh, they, you know, they were in charge of the watch. Uh, and the same is going to happen again. But the period of transition has already started. There's no doubt about that. And when in 2018 in Delhi, we published the first guide to the impact revolution. And we put on the global agenda, 
the notion that impact investment was actually putting us on the path to impact economies and that that was going to be the future. Economies where investors and businesses optimize risk return impact to bring solutions as well as profit, rather than to create problems for governments to solve with increased taxation. That idea seemed far-fetched. Uh, and today it's become mainstream thinking. Thank you, Ronnie. And I hope we get all get to see within our lifetimes this vision. We got a lot of eminent guests here, and let's go get a couple of questions from them, Neha. Sure. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, actually. So we will start with the first question from uh, Visa Lakshi Chandramali. She is the founding managing partner of Tata Capital Healthcare Fund. Visa Lakshi also co chairs IFP Healthcare Medical and Health Tech Impact Community. So, Visa Lakshi, your question. Thank you so much, Neha and uh, 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 Ronnie. It's a delight to hear you speak. I think it's been fantastic uh, to hear you talk about impact accounting and the various uh, aspects about impact. So we, we are essentially a healthcare focused uh, investor and uh, it'll be you know, really great if we can get your thoughts in terms of, you know, given the fact that we've started the decade off with a pandemic and this is clearly an inflection for the next several decades or so. What is, in your sense, uh, you know, some of the dominant impact investing themes that that investors like us should be looking for? Uh, you know, anything that you can throw light on will be uh, will be really valuable for us. Well, uh, actually, first of all, let me express my appreciation to Tata Trust and to Ratan Tata personally for everything you have done to improved lives in, in India. Uh, Thank you. It is a, a, a real tribute to your values and, and your ability. Now, you ask a very interesting question. There are many sectors where the industry isn't focused on delivering impact. So, you can look at uh, the car industry, right? Now, it's delivering social impact, I guess, in terms of enabling people's mobility and so on and so forth. But you can't compare it with healthcare, where the nature of the activity is to improve people's health. The problem is that we have defined success in the healthcare sector in ways that have shaped the wrong business models to prevail. What do I mean by that? You have a huge amount of research in cancer and the breakthrough treatments that emerge cost $300,000 a year. Who can afford them? What type of impact can you deliver? And I think what impact thinking is going to do for the healthcare sector is to shift us to treatments that are both effective and capable of being and accessible in terms of their cost, capable of being used by vast populations. So if you don't look at price in healthcare, you ignore one of the most important impact parameters. And I have been involved, for instance, with a company in the cancer area that is focusing on treatments that cost 10 or $20,000 instead of $300,000. And you have the ability then to drive the price down. Now, India has been fantastic at applying in the area of cataract treatment, for instance low cost models. And I think this bringing together of innovation and affordability is going to be one of the major drivers of, of, of impact. And I, I can see it in the companies uh, that I have invested in. 
where the traditional thinking used to be, I go to the most expensive area uh, because I have the biggest margin serving people who can afford it. And that's how I build my business. I can see that shifting now to people saying, you know what, if my medical product comes out at a low price, I can have a bigger market, I can become the dominant leader in the world, and I can deliver impact to the greatest number of people. Now, there's no doubt that technology is going to enable us to do that. And not just in the area of healthcare, but in the area of education too. Uh, let, let me give you an example which you can also apply in the healthcare area. Education models before digital came along all had to do with bricks and mortar and heavy investment, and therefore charging students ahead of their receiving their education. Now we begin to see remote learning platforms, which provide the education with no upfront cost from the student and get repaid by the increased remuneration the student achieves after graduation and placement into a job. And so this impact thinking is going to disrupt existing models in ways we haven't even begun to understand fully in the same way that technology in its, uh, in its first incarnation did. So I encourage you uh, to keep pushing, to keep Absolutely. innovating. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. We have another question coming in from Purnima Kandelwal. Purnima is the co-founder of INI Farms focus on building a global fruit brand, working with 5,000 farmers across eight Indian states. She is the co-chair of IFP Agritech community as well. Purnima? Uh, thank you so much, Neha. Uh, Ronnie, absolute pleasure hearing you speak on impact and so much on impact assessment and accounting. You know, we started our journey, uh, Ronnie, about 11 years back into the whole horticulture space in India. And impact uh, was not really, you know, talked about in those days. And we've really seen the conversation change on impact in this country over these 11 years. Um, interestingly, Ronnie, we have, we are a venture funded company. So two of our three investors are impact investors. So, you know, the requirement around uh, reporting on ESG, impact, sustainability is, is a part and parcel of our uh, you know everyday being but there are no standards Ronnie so uh, you know while all of them have a requirement but there are no standard requirements and uh, you know that that's that throws its own set of challenges on entrepreneurs and organizations like us um, you know we've recently embarked on an impact assessment study with uh, Aspire we are in the process of uh, doing this assessment study but what I would really like to understand from you, Ronnie, is that is the world really valuing impact assessment today? Uh, you know, do you think that it's it it has tangible, uh, you know, financial and non-financial uh, benefits that are coming to entrepreneurs when they undertake this kind of an assessment? So I'd like to hear your thoughts, Ronnie, on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Purnima. And you're, you're working in an equally important area. There are 400 million small farmers in, in, in the world that boosting their livelihoods uh, has major uh, social impact. And I see a lot of ventures in the agricultural space, uh, including agri-tech, uh, but going beyond uh, agri-tech. So, I think what is going to happen is that investors are going to drive standardization and companies are going to push for it once they see that the bandwagon can't be stopped. What do I mean? 
investors today are investing 70 trillion to achieve impact and they have no standardized way to do it. It's resulting in multiple demands on companies to measure according to different standards. The greater the demand from investors, the madder companies are going to come about the multiple demands they face. And you will then get companies requiring us to get to a single standard. For goodness sake, give us a single coherent set of standards so we can supply the information you need in one go. So it's a, it's a process. The big danger we face is that if we don't get data flowing quickly, there is a danger that ESG would get discredited as a mirage. That people will say, oh, sure, you thought you were getting impact when you invested in ESG, but actually it was just greenwashing or impact washing. There is no such thing. You have to go back to traditional measures of profitability only. And that's why I'm putting so much urgent effort into this area of impact transparency. And I don't think, for Nima, we can stop short of impact accounting. You can't re rely on reporting to give you measures that are sufficiently reliable and standardized. It's inevitable that we will get to some form of impact accounting which is based on standardized metrics. You're measuring tons of, um, of, of, of carbon. Uh, you're measuring uh, the diversity of workforce relative to the population around facilities and describing remuneration levels to the missing people from these communities. And then you have a set of principles to say, this is how we value these outcomes. A ton of carbon could be $300, it could be $50. We agree on, you know, this, this sum. So we're in a period of transition. And the more people like your, yourself uh, try to improve the measurement of your impact, in leading edge ways, I encourage you to go to the data set of uh, the impact weighted accounts at Harvard Business School. Everything is open source. You'll see the data, you'll see reports about how to measure it. If I were running an impact fund today, I would already be on the road to impact accounting. Thank you, Ronnie. And I don't want- and So much, uh, Ronnie. And before our audience start thinking this is an you know this is a accounting webinar, I want to throw in some literature, Ronnie, and ask you a, a tragic question in the you know in the history of the impact movement. And you recall you know how two years back, 181 CEOs in U.S. signed the stakeholder primacy over shareholder wealth, you know. And a year later, Harvard Law School puts an article out that this statement is largely a rhetorical public relations exercise. It, there's been no meaningful change. And they call the paper the illusory promise of stakeholder governance. On the other hand, a person you've known so well, Emmanuel Feber, uh, you know, the rock star of the impact movement, who actually does this impact accounting, he last year published for 2019 carbon adjusted earning per share. He loses his job. People will look at this and say the good is losing, Ronnie. So this is tragic. Is is the good losing here? So the first thing is you can't have a revolution without people opposing it, right? The status quo always fights back. Take the case of Emmanuel Faber. I wrote, I co-wrote an op-ed with George uh, Seraphim and Ethan Ruin. Uh, of uh, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, asking the following question. This was in Le Monde, the, you know, the, the leading uh, newspaper in France. Did the board 
of the known. Appreciate how bad its impact performance is and how well placed Emmanuel Faber is to help them improve it. And the answer is no. Because if you had looked at the impact weighted accounts figures, Danone creates $8 billion a year of negative health impact because of the sugar content of its product relative to its pre-tax profits, its EBITDA, as we call it, of $5 billion. Now, you can compare the profitability of Danone and Nestle and say Nestle does better. And so Danone should try to strive for that. But if you compare the impact performance of Nestle and Danone, Nestle's impact performance is orders of magnitude better. And so it's an accident waiting to happen for Danone that impact transparency drives down the value of the company. And in my view, they got rid of the right guy at exactly the wrong time. Well, please do bring Emmanuel back to center stage, but we'll right now go to a couple of other questions Nea has received. Nea? Sure, we have a question here from Milind Gale. Milind is the Executive Vice President and Chief Information and Security Officer at NSDL eGovernance Infrastructure Limited. Uh, so, Milan, ask your question, please. Thank you, Neha, and uh, very good afternoon to you, Tony. And good evening to all my friends over here. Uh, listening to you for uh, people like me who are new entrants to this subject is like a gold mine of knowledge. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a few views which I would like to say rather than asking a direct question, and I would request you to respond or react to whatever I am saying. First of all, we are very new to this subject. We are throttling, we are trying to learn this particular subject. So whatever views I will mention, please look at it from that point of view, not like an adult ignorant, but an uh, toddling learner. So first is that when it comes to talking about standards, uh, we have seen that there are a lot of product standards. The quality standards are very well known and even uh, quality certification and passing of quality standards is a must for any product to come down to the market and sell their product if they want to sell it uh, really to a good market. As far as the impact is concerned, are there any standards is something which I would like to know specifically from the point of view of bringing the product to the market. But as much as the people would like to uh, embrace impact, make an impact in a positive way. What happens is most of the organizations, as we have also heard you and others during this talk, are compliance oriented. They would do whatever is required for the compliance. Look, for example, the CSR. Till the CSR was mandated, how many organizations were doing any kind of activity in CSR on their own? And after the CSR has been mandated, what is the CSR contribution? exactly the percentage that has been defined in the regulatory requirements. Uh, I hardly find any organizations who do something beyond that and also mention that they don't uh, strictly uh, align to compliance, but they do something more. The second thing is the biggest influencer in this area could be auditors. But I don't hear much about impact from auditors or people who whose words, whose observations are taken very seriously even at a board level and something is done about it to close those kind of observations. And the third thing is the supply chain. If there is an, a chain of six entities in a supply chain and if the first two entities are not adhering to the impact principles, but the third entity in the chain is over aggressive in adhering to that, he goes and neutralizes the harm done by the first two entities. And thereby it all looks as if the whole thing is uh, impact compliant. So there is a risk in actually saying that a particular product is impact compliant, unless and until we know that uniformly all the entities in the chain who are delivering that product are impact compliant. 
and that is where the difficulty comes how do you ensure that all of them are in the chain are also impact compliant because there could be some very small entities and the compliance requirements for them would vary from the compliance requirements for very large entities so these are few views or questions or queries or confusions yep. in my mind okay on the first thing uh, companies will do what is legally necessary uh, and therefore we need governments to step in and to tell them what their obligations are you can't rely on the goodwill of companies to disclose the right data in a comparable way it's self evident auditors i think it was uh, uh, pwc that announced they were recruiting 100000 people to cope with the demand for impact data from their clients and impact you are thinking from their clients the auditors are really getting seriously into this uh, field now two years ago they might have been hesitating doing pilots and so on but now it's translating into serious recruitment supply chains the harvard effort will focus in the next 12 months on measuring supply chain impact you have to measure the impact of every link in the chain and we will be developing approaches that enable us to get as close to that as we possibly can you cannot measure a bit of impact you can't measure environmental impact alone and not social impact and you can't measure the impact of one uh, link in the chain and ignore all the others so you see it with tesla today where people are saying fine you're reducing pollution from the combustion engine but what negative impacts are you creating in manufacturing lithium batteries you know we need to have total impact transparency the good news is i believe it is totally achievable even for the supply chain so we're on the right path if you want to have clearer thinking about it i would suggest two or three things one there are a number of articles now written about impact weighted accounts by professor george serafin i co-authored one in harvard business review search for them you you will um, you will understand better too if you want to understand the bigger picture you can go to my website or the gsg website and download free the guide to the impact revolution that was launched in delhi in 2018 three if you want to have greater granularity you can go to amazon us and buy the e version of my book for less than 3 dollars okay all of the royalties are going to impact charities but i've driven down in the us with my publishers agreement to the price of the ebook i haven't been so successful in doing that from the uk amazon side but i would encourage you to appoint somebody within your firm that focuses on impact measurement and begins to gather all of this information uh, and and uh, the uh, tools that you need in order to achieve it i must tell you that i'm finding startups now startups connecting with the iwas team in order to incorporate their measurements from the very beginning into their venture and it's the future they are talking about it as if it is an integral part of their business dashboard and that's where we will all eventually get 
Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. I'm sure going for my book after this um, meeting is over. Well, the next question is from um, Reema Nanavati, the ED of SEVA and on the Council of Governors for Aspire Circle. Um, she's a Padma Shri awardee. Reema Ben is also the chair of our Gender, Women, Livelihoods and Femtech IFP community. Um, Reema Ben, uh, over to you. Uh, namaste, and it's a pleasure to e meet you after about um, almost two and a half years. Uh, I hope that we get to meet in person again as well. And um, I'm not competent to ask you a question, but I think uh, what we are really looking at or is carving out a pathway is that, you know, the 1.8 million members of SEVA, uh, women workers from the informal economy, all are very, very economically active. These are self-employed women, tiny, nano, micro entrepreneurs have their own tiny enterprises at times as well. Uh, they on a daily basis are also doing impact investing on their own, you know, maybe to start with maybe 100 rupees a day, sometimes then it goes to 500 rupees a day, some are able to um, save up to 1000 rupees a month, and collectively, if you look all the 1.8 million, the, the impact investment is quite large. And the kind of impact this investment leads to is better education for the children of these women, better health care, access to better health care, better nutrition, asset creation, which helps in diversification at times of their trades and occupations. But I'm wondering, and therefore I, I, I come to you to seek as to, you know, um, how can global impact investors follow and invest in these women impact investors, these tiny, tiny micro entrepreneurs or their micro enterprises who are impact investing on their own, but how can the, you know, impact investors globally can also start following them and, you know, uh, partnering or investing with them. So, I hope my question makes sense. It does, it does, Rima, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to see you again, and thank you for everything you have done to improve so many uh, lives. Uh, I'm hopeful that impact transparency and the weighting that uh, it will provide on companies' profitability will drive companies' sales and their investments, as well as investor money, to achieve greater impact. So if you have a company today which has a profit trajectory, and you can measure to and you can measure your impact, and it would enhance the profits that you have on an impact weighted basis. Then you would derive an advantage from delivering greater impact. Now, it's too early uh, for us to know where the first bounce of this particular ball is, you know, is going to be. Is it going to land at your doorstep or is it going to land at the doorstep of healthcare providers uh, who are serving more vulnerable populations? But I think it is very important to provide transparency on gender, everything. Uh, like there is now a powerful trend in the direction of gender equality. The Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative measures differences in gender pay and differences in gender advancement within the company. And I think this transparency will expose the culprits, but also expose role models that others can follow. My firm belief is that companies that include women at the top 
management level and all the way through the organization will deliver better results. Talent is evenly spread between men and women. And if you want to access the best talent, you'd be stupid um, to, you know, to ignore one sex or, or the other. So I think your efforts are going to find themselves part of a mainstream trend now. And then people like uh, Amit and Neha and, and, and their team can help you perhaps to connect with a group of companies or investors who share your same sense of, 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 of mission. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. And thank you, Rima Ben. Uh, Ronnie, we do have another question coming in from uh, Nirav Kambati. Uh, Nirav is the managing partner of Kaizen West with a mission to invest in companies empowering learning innovations. He is the co-chair of our EdTech IFP community. Uh, Nirav, over to you. Ronnie, great to see you again, first of all, and fascinating, as always, listening to your views. Very inspiring indeed. You touched upon the importance of building ecosystems in the space of impact investment. I've been answering to Shashank's question. And based on your experience, Ronnie, of having been part of two of the most successful VC ecosystems in the world, one in the Valley and one in Israel, what would be the lessons that you think we in India can learn if we are aspiring to build an impact ecosystem in the world? that is almost unparalleled. Given the advantages we have as the impact laboratory of the world. Well, Nira, it's a big challenge uh, today. Can you hear me, everyone? Yep, yep. Uh, it, it's a big challenge today uh, for countries the size of India to create ecosystems that are capable of really making a difference. I don't think it can be achieved without the government. Uh, in smaller countries, it could be that the private sector can make sufficient headway for a period of time. In India, it's very difficult um, to make progress if the government isn't supporting you. And so the big challenge you and Amit and others uh, who are leading this movement face is how to get the government on side, how to get the Indian government to appreciate that the private sector through its investors and its businesses and its entrepreneurs and the innovation that it can bring is a necessary partner now if India is to meet its social and environmental goals. We're not there yet. Thank you, Rani. No, quite, quite sort of. Thank you, Rani, very much. Thank you, Nirav. And as we come to the end, Rani, I got to you know tell everyone that, and because I've seen it at close quarters, the book you see behind you is 50 years of Rani's work you know, in the venture capital field and the impact investing field and then leading this movement. And I strongly, strongly encourage all of you to get a copy. We work with Ronnie's office to make it available in India, as he mentioned, including making the e-copy, you know, very, very affordable. And if you look at that cover, please do not miss. It's not just a dollar sign. It's not just the invisible hand of the market, but he's very subtly put the invisible heart out there. And so don't miss it. And that is what this book is really about, the invisible heart of the market. So Ronnie, to raise a word of thanks, we have Ravi Kant with us. Ravi Kant was the former vice chair and managing director of Tata Motors, who took a small domestic commercial vehicle company and made it a global automobile major. And he, you know, and is now an advisor to Aspire Impact. So, Ravi Kanji. Uh, sir, you're on mute. Uh, Ravi, sir. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's my first time with you, sir, Ronald. So it's been fascinating. Uh, the 
your deep thinking and the breadth of knowledge, the passionate concern for society and environment that you bring, and the role being played by you in championing the cause of impact. And of, above all, I think uh, you exude humility all the way through. So that's absolutely fantastic uh, to listen to you these uh, last one and a half hours. So the kind of thing that you're doing, you're really making an impact on impact. So I think that's, that is what is greatly fascinating to me. Uh, in my corporate afterlife, so to say, uh, I've been engaged in healthcare and that your comments in healthcare really resonated very well with me, both on the blindness issue and on cancer cure issue. On cancer cure, I totally agree with you, it's about three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar treatment for cancer cure. I'm associated with a with a company which is into gene therapy, and we want to exactly do what you said to bring that three hundred thousand to thirty thousand to fifteen thousand dollars per patient. And then by bringing the, the manufacturing to India, it is a Harvard Medical School initiative, uh, ex Harvard Medical School people. And so we are trying to bring that down to, and I think it will then become this thing. Similarly, another cancer thing is to get it to mass uh, of, uh, of for screening and diagnosis and other things. And another one is on, on you talked about uh, elimination of blindness to, to simple operations of, uh, of cataract uh, costing less than $50. But I would like to just, through a challenge because that's what I'm struggling with. Uh, we want to make uh, India, especially the low uh, geographies in India and then later in the world, blind free. Now the question is always we are getting into this thing is to, and we 80% of, of the operations we do is free of cost. How can, so this is not about my association with the organization, but can we make world blind free? And how can we use the impact economy, the impact initiative that you're talking about to take one problem and then take it out of the world? How is it possible? So I'm trying to find out as to how to combine the two, how to combine the need to say, just take one thing, how to, because what we have seen is when a blind person is given an eye, and when I say blind, is is my lateral, is blind in both eyes. When he's given an eye, his income increases by 400%. So he's adding a lot to the society. So if you were to take this kind of thing, and how to make it worldwide through impact. So what can impact do to make it real impact in the society? And that's what I'm struggling with. You need not answer if you don't have time, but I can uh, no. talk to you later. But like this, there are other challenges too. So I think we have to break open the constraints of traditional business thinking. Uh, Ravi, if you take the issue which I describe in the book of uh, creating spectacles for the blind that enable them to see by whispering in their ear, the page of the book they're reading by recognizing 300 people who have previously been recognized. You achieve fantastic impact through that technology on 35 million blind people's lives and 250 million visually impaired people's lives. But if you think as an impact entrepreneur rather than a traditional business entrepreneur and you ask yourself the question how can this technology help the greatest number of people in the world you come up with a surprising answer which is what if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world what would it do for 800 million people's lives to go from being illiterate to being able to read, okay? And then you say, well, okay, at what price could you supply these spectacles? How much would it cost to take an illiterate person 
and enable them to read? And the answer is $200. For a product which is selling at $4,000 today to a normal market, the company preparing it for philanthropic reasons would make a million units available at $200 a unit. Okay? Now, if you think traditionally, you say, well, there's no way an illiterate person can afford $200. So how can I solve illiteracy in, in the adult population? But if you think in impact terms, you can create a model where you focus first on people who are illiterate but are in jobs. You approach the companies that employ them. You see whether you can persuade them to buy the spectacles at $200 and get repaid through a percentage of the increase in remuneration that an illiterate person gets if they have the ability to read. And if not, you can raise sources of impact capital to fund the $200 and get repaid in the same way that we are doing for career impact funds. And so, Somebody like yourself who has been able to scale businesses globally, if you begin to apply your mind to that single issue, illiteracy in India, and devote your effort to achieving that, you will do it. We have the tools to do it today. We have the technology, we have the financial instruments, we have sufficient numbers of business leaders and others who are prepared to optimize risk return impact as OrCam is prepared to do by providing the product at the knockdown price. Thank you. Thank you, Raviji. And thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you for those 90 fabulous minutes of insights across a range of topics. We will, you know, put these out for mass consumption, some of these lovely bites we heard from you on the media. And I think on behalf of everyone who was here, thank you, thank you very much. I know it, uh, you know, this was, you know, wonderful. And I know we, on this online media, we can't, uh, you know, cheer and clap for you as we would have done if you were like you were in 2008, but thank you very much. And those of you who can unmute themselves and, you know, help us raise a little bit of an applause for Sir Ronald Cohen, please do so now. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you so much. And we're wishing you all the very best. And uh, we'll get the word out on, you know, the impact revolution in India. Goodbye. Onwards and upwards. Thank you. Onwards.